on this episode of Fault Lines, driving Detroit. The auto industry is collapsing, Washington is stepping in with a massive restructuring, and people's lives hang in the balance. And in the post-industrial rubble, seeds of resistance take root. Here in Detroit, it's not exactly news that the auto industry is in crisis. This factory used to employ 15,000 workers, turning out 200,000 cars a year. It's been abandoned for more than half a century. But even for Detroit, these are extraordinary times. In Washington, D.C., President Obama's auto task force is re-engineering the fates of GM and Chrysler and the millions who depend on their survival. We've come here to ground zero of the automotive world to try to understand how the deals cut in the nation's capital affect the people who live with the consequences. And we're finding something unexpected. Yes, there are parts of this city that are dying, families and homes literally falling to pieces. But there's also something fiercely alive here, a spirit of resilience, of resistance, and perhaps amid the ruins of industrial capitalism, glimpses of a more sustainable way of life. Even before the financial crisis exploded, Detroit had the highest home foreclosure rate in the country, the highest unemployment rate of any major U.S. city. In the auto sector alone, one in three jobs has vanished since the recession began. After years of steady decline, this sudden plunge of the big three car companies is shaking Detroit to its core. Almost everyone here is connected to the industry somehow. For instance, while General Motors today has well under 100,000 employees, a shadow of its former workforce, it is still responsible for providing health care to more than a million people. In trying to understand the roots and the future of this crisis, we bypass the usual automotive analysts and other oft-quoted experts. Instead, we talk to a wider cast of characters, people who have lived a lifetime in the shadow of the big three. Love on. A piano teacher. And I'm also a GM child. My father died on a plant floor after 27 years. An auto worker facing layoff. Well, I don't understand it. I mean, why would you be squeezing the workers? I mean, you made millions on the back of the workers on, on the sweat of our bra. A GM executive. It's hard to resist the temptation to buy something just a little bit bigger and a little bit more powerful than maybe you really need. A 94-year-old revolutionary. Folks come from all over the world to, to see what it means to rise from the depths of the industrialization. And a welfare rights activist. They call it urban renewal, we call it urban removal. When it comes to living with the decisions made at the commanding heights of industry, the experts are to be found on the ground. Hi, Dad. Come in. <laughs> How you doing, Dad? John and Jesus Martinez spent a combined 66 years at General Motors. So you fall down, Dad? Yeah, I went down. Father and son are both retired now. No hurt? Nothing hurts. You're lucky. We're not crying. We're not asking for anything. You know, we're, we're not begging. But we had a contract. We sacrificed. With the intent that when you get old, when you work your butt off and you get hurt, that's why they made these things, man, because that's what was going on during the years so they can protect this old guy and me, you know. And my father's not a complainer. What? You don't complain. Well, can do nothing about it. See? Healthcare costs are a major preoccupation for U.S. automakers, costing them $1,500 more per car than their rivals. Had the big three put their political clout behind the drive for universal health care in the U.S., things might be different today. As it is, health care costs weigh heavily on the balance sheets, and hundreds of thousands of workers, retirees, and their families may lose the benefits they were counting on. If, if they cut us any money 
Can you imagine not being able to give your, your, your daughter five dollars? And see, all this work we did was for that. So we can have something for your kids. Yeah. It shouldn't have to be like that. Anyone working in the auto industry today is in the same boat. And Barack Obama has pinned their hopes on a small group of hand-picked deal makers, the president's auto task force. Since February, it has been sitting around the table with the union, the big three car companies, and the banks and bondholders to which they owe billions. Its achievements so far are well known. Chrysler forced into bankruptcy. Bondholders and the union swapping debt for a stake in the new company. GM expected to follow a similar path. Less discussed is what the task force members themselves bring to the table. The two in charge are Steve Ratner, an investment banker who got his start at Morgan Stanley, and Ron Bloom, for years with the Steelworkers Union. Before that, he was an investment banker. They're Wall Street types. Ralph Nader has been taking on both Wall Street and the big three since his days as a consumer safety crusader in the 1960s. Wall Street, which produces nothing, is being sent by President Obama to restructure the auto companies in Detroit, who at least produce something. They are involved in reality, dealers, suppliers, workers, not the virtual reality of wild speculation on Wall Street. But Wall Street was already in the heart of the auto industry. Chrysler is owned by a private equity fund, which also owns GMAC, the financing arm of General Motors. And the Wall Street Detroit connection goes even further. GMAC and Chrysler Credit and Ford Credit uh, in varying degrees, got involved in this whole derivatives situation. And a lot of the instability and the precipitous uh, plunge of the auto companies was a, a reflection that they lost their shirt too, just like the way Wall Street does, speculating. In fact, the recent stress tests of 19 big banks revealed that GMAC has an $11 billion hole in its balance sheet, thanks to its quest for mega profits in high-risk investing. Lots of blame to go round, as they're fond of saying in Washington these days, though blaming the system itself is less popular. The worst thing we could do is blame free market capitalism for this. We have to blame the government intervention and the Federal Reserve System for our problems. So what do you think ought to happen to the big three now? Well, it's a terrible situation because uh, they have failed, they will fail, and if they, if they continue in name only, it's it's artificial, it's propping up, they should be allowed to fail. The truth is that Chrysler and GM are neither being allowed to fail nor being simply propped up. They are being shoved into bankruptcy, where many of their obligations to dealers, creditors, and employees can be easily stripped away. The question is, why are they pushing for bankruptcy? The answer is, 10 years ago, General Motors decided their future was China and that they'd written off the domestic market so they have abandoned America. This company that was born in the U.S., General Motors, is basically turning its back on America and saying, bye-bye, we're going to China. Next year, GM will manufacture two million cars in China, and China will be the number one auto manufacturing uh, country in the world, ahead of the U.S. and Japan. In Detroit, that milestone will mark the final phase of a long declining way of life. Talking to people here, it's clear how dominant the car making culture has been and how advanced the debate is about what went wrong. A hundred thousand workers worked at that Rouge complex. You have less than 5,000 workers out there now. The world has changed. There were seven baseball leagues in the second shift of workers at Dodge Main. Seven, so many people. Now Dodge Main is gone. The same number of automobiles are being manufactured with these many workers. So how did GM drop the ball? Um, I don't know that we dropped the ball. It, you know, one of our Tom, former- you're facing bankruptcy, someone <laughs> dropped the ball. Well, for one of our former chairmen, I think, put it very well. When you're wildly successful for 75 years with a specific business model and a specific way of doing business, it's very hard to change that, even when you start to realize it may not be working. And again, I don't think the auto industry is unique in that regard. We knew in the back of our heads that the automotive jobs were not going to always be here. See, the people on the ground knew that. 
Now, the people who sit in lofty places and beautiful offices were looking at their bottom line and said, well, as long as our bottom line remains here, we're not going to change a thing. In the boom years, the big three bet heavily on powerful SUVs, while Japanese car companies surpassed them with more fuel-efficient cars. Could it have been because the profit margin on SUVs is five times higher? Not according to the industry. Partly, I think Americans just live large. Um, and, you know, if you go to Texas, I mean, it's a perfect example. I mean, people tend to drive long distances. They tend to have fairly large families. They tend to have a lot of stuff. You know, we're Americans, we like a lot of stuff, and then you want a big vehicle to like call the family and the stuff with. We weren't thinking of the consumer when we came up with these big gas guzzling, burning fossil fuel things when we were talking about making GM, Chrysler, and Ford viable companies. We didn't even adhere to the information you were giving out to the public. Behind closed doors, make more gas guzzlers, Get that money. The unions are going to have to sacrifice. Investors are going to have to sacrifice. People who work at the companies are going to have to sacrifice. And, and there will be pain for the community. The human cost of more cuts to auto jobs will only highlight what people here have been saying for decades. The economy needs to diversify. And there have been some attempts. Like many U.S. cities, Detroit's version of diversification was to go big, subsidizing big hotels, casinos, and sports stadiums. These businesses have transformed the downtown and have certainly been profitable. But when the games are over and the crowds have returned to the suburbs, what's the legacy of all this new development? Maureen Taylor of the Michigan Welfare Rights Organization took us on a tour of downtown. The gentrification in this neighborhood started about 10, 12 years ago. And it's almost complete where low income and working people have just been displaced. We're approaching one of the more expensive condominium and townhouse uh, conglomerates anywhere in the world. And that's these group of homes that are right here to my left. And they're the homeless veterans on the other side of the street begging people to come into their parking lot. I mean, what a dichotomy. This, 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 ooh, what would you call this? This abomination that exists right here, the Motor City Casino. All of this public housing that used to be on these three blocks, all destroyed because Motor City needed parking structures. And you have so much of this, and it happened so quickly, so quickly, nobody was able to absorb the total collapse of what was going on. So people are still trying to right themselves and trying to figure out how they can stand up under this tremendous assault of not having any income, not having any food. Visions of Detroit in its first heyday. The dream of a powerful industrial society. Workers from the rural south became an urban working class, then a rising middle class. Detroit's auto industry gave birth to the assembly line, the crucible of modern industrial capitalism. The fact that a hundred years ago, we were the national and international symbol of the miracles of industrialization and that we have now become the national and international symbol of the devastation of deindustrialization has given us a head start on how to make the transition from an industrial to a deindustrial to a post-industrial society. That transition is no longer optional. Much of what was born here is now coming to an end. The auto industry is in crisis. The high-paying jobs that drove the growth of America's legendary consumer society are melting away. And the powerful labor struggles that founded some of the country's strongest unions have given way to decades of concessions. 
There's a lot of talk out of Washington these days about how all parties in the auto sector have to make sacrifices to get through this crisis. What you don't hear about is how many sacrifices auto workers already made before this crisis even began. Take this factory, American Axle. Last year, workers here lost a brutal three-month strike and had their wages virtually cut in half. Now, they've just found out that the owner wants to close the plant completely and move production to Mexico. It's bullshit. Most people then lost their houses, or kids had to come out of college, or you know, had to turn their cars in for repossession. I don't understand how you think you're gonna bleed the little man, you know, when the when the when the money is being made at the top. I know the city is really hurting, and right now it looks like the last one out turning the lights out. For most Detroiters, it is a very bleak time. But there are some people here who look out over the wasteland and see a fertile plain. The way that I look at Detroit is that we have the space to begin anew. Ever revolutionary at 94 years old, Grace Lee Boggs has been at the heart of every social movement that has swept through Detroit since the Second World War, from black power to environmentalism. So this is the famous Boggs Center. Today, she's both an inspiration and a local philosopher for those who are trying to forge local alternatives to a broken status quo. You can look at vacant lots in one way, you can look at it as, as abandonment, you can look at it as the end of civilization, or you can look at it as the beginning of the new. Detroit has lost so many homes and businesses that it now has 130 square kilometers of vacant land within its city limits. So these guys right here are eggplants, tomatoes. Over here and here, these are both ground cherries. These guys are all hot peppers here and sweet peppers. Back here, just starting to come up, are all the melons. So, so how here. many seedlings do you distribute in a year? Um, over 100,000 get distributed. Growing in these empty spaces is the largest network of urban food production in the United States. More than 400 community gardens, harvesting 165 tons of food last year. It's a win-win of folks need economic development, but I think there's a lot bigger aspect to it of that, you know, taking control of the food system really gives folks um, this opportunity to, to rethink their place in the world and say, you know, if I can take care of this very basic need, what else can I do? There's the literal, literal seed and there's also the metaphorical seed that's planted in folks' mind of what more this could be. Planting gardens is not only to produce food, but it's all to, to reconnect with the earth, it's also to reconnect with one another. I think that's began to change the culture of the city. Back in downtown Detroit, next door to the new baseball stadium, the Central United Methodist Church is hosting its Monday drop-in lunch. Bobby Thompson's job is to entertain the crowd. She's part of a tightly knit community supporting those who have been displaced by new development and gentrification. Unfortunately, it, it probably has two pictures. One of them is the dying of a city. However, there are those of us up under the rubble when the building fell that it didn't fall on us, that we walked out of the entrance and we moved on. The building fell in for Bobby and her four daughters after she fell behind on paying her utility bills. That triggered an impersonal bureaucratic process that ultimately took her children away, sending them into foster care. The trigger was when her water was shut off. That sent up the red flag to Department of Social Service. They came out on Monday. They took two from in my home and two from school. It took me 22 months to get them back. We've worked through a lot of issues around um, abandonment, you know, them just being left. They really felt left out. Um, I'm very close to them. It's been hard work. Bobby and her daughter still live together, the girls now heading to university. But their journey through Detroit's broken education system has not been easy. In the last decade, the city has closed 70 schools, as enrollment has dropped almost in half. As more schools close and the city continues to shrink, Bobby blames the city leaders who never developed an effective plan B while the auto industry crumbled. 
We chose drone work instead of brain work. And now we're stuck. Now we're stuck. I have to send my daughters out of the state with my blessings to never come back. There's nothing here for them. On the other side of town, in an old school rescued from abandonment, an experiment is going on that is changing the prospects for some of the city's most vulnerable. And at first I was a little skeptical, like, oh my God, an all-girls school, it's not gonna work. I don't like to be around girls, but it's, not, it's really not that bad. Uh, remember we studied last week who invaded China? Catherine Ferguson Academy is not just an all-girls school. It's a high school for teen mothers. 90% of students here graduate and get into college. It's going to be featured on this week's exam. Evelyn, who got pregnant in ninth grade, is now finishing her final year and going on to study neonatal nursing. They raise uh, farm animals where they plant gardens and fruit trees, where they build their own barn, where they can bring their children to class. I mean, they see education in a different way. They see education as related to life. I want him to just feel the love, to keep going, to know that he can become the best possible person, whatever he wants to do. Duty, you ready to go get a haircut? I will hope that he will be like me. <laughs> or better, better than me. Outside of these pockets of hope, Detroit is still a battered city. A thousand citizens a month are still leaving. Average home price, less than $6,000. But in spite of, or maybe because of, what people here have been through, resilience seems to run through the city's veins. A belief that the empty spaces can be filled with new forms of community. A conviction that there is no alternative to building alternatives. It's going to take a lot more twisting and a lot more maneuvering, but we will get out. We will dig out. This is Detroit. We're not going down. We're not going to fight because we're not going down. <laughs> you know, Joe Lewis taught us well, <laughs> keep swinging. And that's what we're going to do. I have faith that the masses of people will say, you know, we can eat, we can build houses, we can build cars. We do not have to live like this. We do not have to live like this. What time do you think it is on the clock of the universe? I think that all of us need to understand that whereas the dinosaurs were wiped out presumably by an external cause, if we're wiped out, it's by an internal cause. It's by something that we have done, by the, by the values we have lived by, and that we can change those values. That's what humanity is all about. And we're just sort of waiting until we're able to line up all the stars, and we're almost there. Those stars get lined up, we're going to be hell on wheels when we come out of this cocoon. So it may be looking a little strange right now, but that's fine. We're stirring. <laughs>